state system number and code name. Hi, I'm Patricia Hurst. This is Nonplus number three, which interviews X, superheroines, the Minutemen, and the Flesh Eaters. Regular features in this issue include pre record with Levi Dexter and discontents with Don Bowles of 45 Grave. It's been a long journey from the swamp of the mask to the spotlights of the Greek theater, but X seems to have managed it with ideals intact. After watching the band prove themselves with two albums on Slash, Electra Records released Under the Big Black Sun, which surpassed even the high expectations of X's fans. Nonplus joined Billy Zoom, Don Bonebreak, John Doe, and Xene Cervanka to talk about Los Angeles. Discovers different kinds of music at different times, mm -hmm. right? If you just discovered country and western music, and you go, God, this is so great, you know, and it happened 20 or 30 years ago, it still doesn't make you any dumber or smarter. Well, to a certain degree, but if you're, <laughs> if you're only if, if you're only uh, 13 years old and, and you just discovered James Brown, it's like probably this amazing discovery for you. Yeah. Uh, but you couldn't have discovered it when you were five, mm -hmm. <laughs> probably. Actually, you'd have to go back to prenatal on and, and, uh, <laughs> a lot of them. On everything, good, pretty much. If you're 13, yeah, yeah the poor things. Or, or, or <laughs> dis discovering, people discover blues at different times. People yeah. discover punk rock at different times. People discover Otis Redding at different times. Well, uh, yeah, but things like that, that kind of, all that music is so timeless and stuff, too. And, but people that come around now, I think a lot of times what happens with if you talk to people that have been going to shows for a while, years, since the beginning, they'll say, oh yeah, oh God, X, blah, 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 and I never even go to see them anymore, there's all these people. I think the reason people say that kind of stuff is because it kind of separates them from the masses and makes it like, well, I knew about it when it was happening and now it's ruined, it's been ruined and I just won't go. And so maybe to them it is ruined, but that shouldn't mean that we're doing anything to cause that. Yeah, there, I guess there, there are a couple elements in liking a band, you know. One is being part of the discovery, discovering a band, you know, when they, when the band first starts out and when you're first listening to that kind of music, and then just the music, apart from all the social phenomena that surrounds it. I think, I think every fan, just by being a fan, prepares him or herself to be betrayed. And I think it's a sad situation. Because they expect you to, to, to do the same thing that you, you've already done. And, and no artist ever does that. And, and it's, it's just people are, in America now want their, their heroes to fail. They, they want um, their actor hero to to do a crummy role so they can say, oh, they're fucked now. They were good before, but they're oh, fucked. I want heroes to fail. <laughs> well, you're different than most people. I always want your hero to fail. People it's not a conscious, excited. it's not a, it's not a conscious effort. It's like subconscious that, that they're waiting for them to, to screw up. I 
Mexicans in LA. I um, could identify with them and their cars. Mm -hmm. Having an old car myself. And Billy we're having we're disliked by a lot of the same people. <laughs> that in yeah. um, I think they're I think they're real mean. To us, you know, to a certain extent, I don't really identify with smoking dust and shooting people with handguns. If you really got down and, and uh, uh, figured out what the new doors would be, I guess we would have to be them, huh? I mean, new doors would have to come from Los Angeles, and they'd have to... Mm -hmm. well, they wouldn't necessarily have to like the uh, old doors, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> in that case. Pretty, uh, it was weird, because I was talking to... Um, Does that mean I have to be Ray, or am I Robbie, Robbie Krieger? Oh, God, don't be Robbie Krieger. <laughs> symbols are very powerful, mm -hmm. whether they have meaning or not. No, I don't think that there's any kind of real power in it. I just don't take it seriously, and I think the reason that so many people wear religious things or make a mockery of it, for instance, or something, is just to show that they don't really believe in it, is that mm -hmm. the symbols have been twisted around since, since the beginning of time anyway, and just one more generation twisting it around and making fun of it is... It's not that important, I don't think. I think it's pretty normal. We were talking about reading the Bible, and I said I could never get past the first page where the giants come down and fuck the, the daughters of the earth band, you know. I never could quite figure out even the first page. Beyond Baroque, where I used to work, mm -hmm. and they said, Dear Exine, it was a form letter, but it said, We are compiling a list of prominent LA poets, top five most influential books of poetry in your life. Please fill out this list and give a brief explanation of why these five books are the most important poetry books, blah, 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 so that we can use this list as a reference for, for new poets and all this. And I just thought, I don't. I never read any poetry or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I would say we're writers, but I wouldn't say we're poets because I couldn't. I can't even think of one book of poetry that I could put on a list. Chuck Berry's Golden Decade. That's about it. You know, I mean, how could you how could you sit down and read a book of poetry? Where's Reading's Greatest Hits? I would say no. I'm not a poet. What would you say? I would say yes. You are a poet. has created the ultimate instrument of death, your phone. Sounds pretty off the wall to me. I mean, a telephone killing people? You're telling me that a telephone killed a girl. Bell, starring Richard Chamberlain. 
I'll call you. Ring once, hang up, and then ring again. Bells. The panic has just begun. Bells. Rated R. Under 17, not admitted without parent. Their shrieks were wild and uncanny, creating a scene that only mass assassination could describe. What shall I do? What shall I do? The superheroines rose from the ashes of the Speed Queens to be included on the Hell Comes to Your House compilation. Eva O, oh, Delmar Richardson, and Sandra Ross spoke with Nonplus through a smoke cloud about their new Bemis Brain Records release, Cry for Help. Heroes. Like superheroes? Yeah. But we're yeah. girls, though. So. I mean, well, they're the superheroines. <laughs> they're the they're the superheroines and just the drama. Speed Queens, <laughs> like people thought that was like drugs, but that we got no, that from the superheroine, Speed Queen, the drug Jesus. heroine. No. <laughs> We're putting out an English import and a German import of this Hell Comes to Your House album. And on the German import, they're going to take off um, Bomb Love, and they're going to put on this one song called Blue Blood that's also on there, but we taped it for the Hell Comes to Your House album. Are they going to do that? They're going to put Blue Blood on it, oh. which I think is good, because I think that song's good, and I like that recording of it. Because we did five songs for the Hell Comes to Your House album, and they, and they, they only took two of them. Okay. So they're going to take off Red Cross, and they're going to put Strong Silent Types on and do a different Modern Warfare song. Mm -hmm. And they cut off some conservatives and secret hate songs. You know, those bands each did three songs. They're taking, like, some of their songs off. Yeah. So they're going to be different. I think it's going to be neat. The cover's going to be different. Superheroines gained a certain amount of notoriety when No Magazine ran an interview that featured photographs of Eva in bondage. I had those pictures taken before, and I asked him if he wanted to use them because I know he uses stuff like that in his magazine. <laughs> it gives me a little more entertainment, you know, when I go out. No, <laughs> it was just, I don't know, he just... We just smoked a bunch of fun talk. <laughs> <laughs> Made up a bunch of things, no. Yeah, they're all lies. Yeah, they're all lies. <laughs> 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 Somebody uh, called me up at three in the morning one time asking Kim for Fowley. Eva. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Mr. Kim. <laughs> oh, that was so horrifying. <laughs> well, these two guys weird. that I know, they were hitting me up saying, do you really do that stuff? Do you really people. do that kind yeah. of stuff? And it's like, it has nothing to do with me. It's just Eva's, you know. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people smoke pot with me, me more now. Alistair Crowley, and I guess maybe some of it kind of rubbed off on her or something, so she wanted to, you know, do a song called The Beast, but not make it sound, you know, on the satanic side, because The Beast isn't satanic at all. If, if, if it, you know, sounded more satanic or something like that, it would probably be a gore rock song, but it's, it deals more away from that. Mm -hmm. It's, there's, subject matter makes a difference, too. Yeah. Well, we're talking about mostly is a, stage. It's like it's you know? like all um, I don't know. They talk about death and vampires and <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. And and 
um, let me see. What they're just like into spook things, you know. And the beast has nothing to do with that. It's about the beast. <laughs> and he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell. Save ye that have the marks of the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is the wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of the beast. That, that was not my idea. She wrote the song. I did the, I, it was my idea to have a little kid in the beginning. Because yeah. I like kids. He's my little sister. Gotta have a kid on the That does a little girl's wife. I don't want to sound like anybody, you know, because I'm sure it's like you're supposed to be this original band and do <clears> original <throat> music and then you're wrong. You sound like so-and-so, you know. Oh, supposed to con take it as a compliment. Good. We've been, you know, we want to sound like them or something. We're just, we're just, just like gradually getting out of this, you know, gore rockness, I guess. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. We were never really into it either. No, not really. New grave rockers. <laughs> Yeah. Dead no, serious. Dead. No, oh. that's what it said one time ago. <laughs> you know, our songs have death and shit in it, but we've always had that. Speed Queen's always just had that. In this edition of Pre-Record, Nonplus would like to introduce Levi Dexter with a track he recorded with the Rip Chords. Produced by Richard Goderer, the song is called I Get So Excited. Well, I'm getting tired of working day to day Getting up and sick to do what other people say Sometimes I get depressed and I have to move away Cause the only time I'm happy is when I'm rocking on the stage Yeah, get so excited When I
Nonplus will continue with the Minutemen, Flesh Eaters, and Don Bowles on side two. Good luck, Jim. Pedro is a blue-collar city near Los Angeles that is also the home of the Minutemen. Known as minimalist purveyors of white funk, they have recently released an album on their own New Alliance Records through SST. George Hurley, Dee Boone, and Mike Watt join Nonplus to confirm that their name really does reflect the length of their songs. Well, they were less than a minute at first. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It was a physical thing. We couldn't hang. <laughs> just couldn't. I, oh, what happened just last like, gig in the reactionaries? I passed out. And dropped, broke my bass. Broke his bass in half. You know, yeah. you know, we just like you know we you know we got tired of repeating verses. Yeah, we yeah, had no like singer without Martin. See, yeah, just, and so choruses we really couldn't sing. You know, <laughs> just like this is a secret and we're letting out, but we really can't sing. See, so we only wanted to yell the essential information in the choruses. You know, it's none of that. So. There's another reason. Well, there are psychedelic songs where we, we repeat. The new songs now are about a minute, 20, minute, 30. <laughs> and like on the album, they're 45 seconds, 50. So that's the direction. You know, we're getting stronger. <laughs> Something about the funk beat, like we got tired of heavy metal. Yeah, that's what this 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 new punk rock stuff stuff is now. Is all at first, it was real different. We have our own idea of our funk. Yeah, it's mid man. It ain't really funk. Yeah, we played a funk that we were all interested in. Pop group is this real intense kind of. Maybe the only thing white guys can really get intense on, you know, as as far as playing, they got that heavy old (laughs) beat without getting trapped, you know. That's what's wrong with a lot of the black groups. They get trapped in, in their riff, and they can't stretch it out and get intense. And pop group could. Same with Beefheart. It's in between, black and white. It's much further than I would like. That's the rule. Like, if you're working class, you should be stupid. And that's stupid. Yeah. Maybe you're forced to be working class, you know? And then, you know, you should well, be forced with, to be stupid. It's kind of interesting because, like, I work with professional people with college educations. And, yeah. You know, they have the boring s- as hell. This, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have the same type of, um, you know, attitudes as, like, people who just had six years of school and working a job and busting their back. And all the working men are in bands. The world will change. You know, when all working men are artists, <laughs> things will change. Art's pretty important. Right? Just we're in a band, and it seems like kind of easy. <laughs> I mean, come on. I, I know what you're you think you're a genius? <laughs> I mean, we're really gifted. <laughs> come on. I just think, you know, art is like, pretty much um, something that everybody should be a part of. Every, everybody should participate because there's no good art and there's no bad art. It's just art. 
you know, it's really kind of ambiguous mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, but it's like another sense. Yeah, right. You know, so it's, I see you it, here, you, you know, think and put it on the paper. Yeah, right. It's expression is what it really comes down to. You know, it's like throwing yourself out. Yeah, but see, it sounds like the whole thing is like you got to legitimize it, and like it's that, not when you hear a band where, like that's, that's where I like this. commercialism ruins but artists like, and just people who like want to express art. themselves is because it's like, well, I can't do it as well as this person, <laughs> and they go like, well, I'll never do it again. <laughs> producer that did that in the 60s oh. like took a bunch of bands or a different bunch of people made all these different bands out of them uh, Spectre oh, yeah Spectre yeah see you know like that you, know, you had this little, he had little the sound yeah a little plan to make loads of money and you know I guess he did now if you like that shit you liked it but if you tr- look behind it you might get sick Big Red Stab Jam Big Red Stab Jam Not artistic Just like home to me. They're back to the map. They set a new course. The journey backwards. Spill the beans and make me sing. You know, I guess after you've been around long enough, people just like, well, these guys are okay. Bullshit. Yeah. They'll hate you if you suck. If well, you that's suck, true, yeah. yeah. There is a there is a gap, though, man, because when I, we were playing the At whiskey first, with fear yeah. and those guys' faces, the 14, I really can't get it over what I'm trying to say to them because, man, when I was that age, I, I don't know. I was too caught up in the image, you know, of the rock star. Maybe that's what they are. But when punk came around, you could really know what's happening with the dude by looking in his mm-hmm. face. And it's re- and, and, and when you're on stage and you see these little kids, it's, it's it's really neat. I wish I was that age and I could start my band and write my own songs. You know, we didn't know this till we were like 20. <laughs> but those kids have their chance, but they're fucking keep putting on uniforms and ruining it. Yeah. By by joining punk army, they ain't gonna save the world. I'm sorry, because I've been part of punk army for a few years now. And, <laughs> The only way I could do it was get in the minute, man, and do my own thing. This time, the fabulous foursome face their most evil foe. And if you don't believe me, bring your skeptical little ear a little closer so you don't miss a drop of this adventure. Several years ago, Chris Desjardins was a rock critic and poet who wanted to form his own band, and from that gleam, The Flesh Eaters was born. On the first two albums, Chris assembled some of his friends from then-unheard-of bands like X and The Blasters. Chris D., Don Kirk, Chris Wall, and Robin Jameson are the now permanent lineup, as unveiled on Forever Came Today on Ruby Records. Have you ever read, there's a book by uh, Joan Didion called Play It As It Lays. Have you ever read that book? The last page of that book <clears throat> explains real well what this the kind of music is. Which is, is that, what I said earlier, that, you know, you see that there is nothing or maybe there's nothing in your life. I mean, for me, I'm not speaking yeah. for these other guys, but for me, you see that there's nothing, but you keep There's nothing going. in your life, man. You're right. <laughs> you keep going. You keep going anyway. I identify with all those lyrics. You thought of seeing someone? I was rather happy sounding on them. I thought so too. I, all the desperation. <laughs> you know, you've got to read through the lines of all that desperation. Who's, I don't get this desperation yeah, concept. I, I really don't see it like that. I, I see some desperation, but I don't see it as overwhelming. <laughs> friends of mine who went down to Mexico to get married and the person uh, has got a 56 Ford and, but that's my only part the rest is just the second verse is uh, just real I mean real personal of what I think about loving someone having a relationship with somebody 
But it's it's within in the context of a story about uh, two people on the run from the law and being forced into a situation out, out of your control by circumstances. <laughs> The girl is killed by her father. That turns the guy into, um, I guess, a criminal or a murderer, or whatever you want to call it, a thief. And uh, and then he gets killed in the end by the police. But Hand of Glory is kind of, a, which comes after it on the record, is like a prologue to that. It's good, kind of prelude of how that happened. But it's, I mean, it's just, it's all, it's not really specific. It's just the bare bones of this story and the uh, relationship between two people who really love each other. But don't really have a chance. Rosie Hours is one of the songs where you use your voice to its maximum. You, you get down in the low registers a little, which is it's real nice to hear your voice down there. And your voice has a lot of power down there. Yeah, that's my, that's my favorite one to sing. That thing is a really personal song. It's about a personal <clears throat> situation in my life. What happened, Chris? <laughs> oh, you don't want to know, man. You just don't want to know. <laughs> Oh, the stuff on the um, insert, that's from, let me see, this is from, this part here is from a story called Ancient Sorceries by Algernon Blackwood. This stuff is from The Pit and the Pendulum by um, Edgar Allan Poe. This is from um, Phantom of the Opera, that book. Um, this is from a story called Carmilla that came out, um, was written in the 19th century, and this um, down here is from Legia by Edgar Allan Poe. When I was reading Phantom of the Opera, there was um, a part of the book where this guy, he wasn't really the hero of the story, but he was um, just one of the characters, and he was riding across this underground lake on a rowboat, and there was this house carved out of the wall of the, um, the bottommost cellar of the opera. As he was going across the lake, he started to hear this singing, and it sounded like it was coming from underneath the water. It turns out that Eric, who's the opera ghost, would the way he would lure people to his house, he would be underwater with um, a reed and be singing through this reed, breathing and singing through this reed, because he had this incredible voice. And then um, he would sneak up around the boat and uh, the singing would get louder and louder and the person in the boat would be looking over the edge to try and figure out where it was coming from. And he would like reach up out of the water and drag him into the water and strangle him and um, drown him in the water. <laughs> Kids. And that's where that that's where that story that's how I got the idea for that song. Although it's it's about something different, but that's what gave me the idea for it. I know that I'm singing better on this. I know how to sing mm -hmm. compared to the last one where I was just starting to uh, uh, get to the point where I could sing. Mm. Sing the way I want. He's getting his Doesn't... yodeling down. Yeah, right. He's been in, you know, up in the hills for a while now and working on that. You wanted to fill out in school. <laughs> some bookers, especially 
here in Los Angeles who um, seem to be totally unaware of anything outside the four walls that they, you know, where their office is. They like to pigeonhole people, and um, as far as the flesh eaters go, they've, they haven't been as responsive as I've liked, would have liked, to uh, the idea that there is a new lineup that is just as good. This is much more of a band, though. It's much more of a unit. Yeah. It's, we don't, you know, I don't think any of us feel like we're playing in Chris's band. Right. We're playing in the flesh eaters. Final Fetish, the largest selection of alternative music in Los Angeles. Vinyl Fetish, featuring the latest in imported and domestic publications. Vinyl Fetish, 7305 Melrose Avenue. In this edition of Discontents, Nonplus welcomes Don Bowles of 45 Grave with his opinions on recently released records. <laughs> Diamanda Galas, The Litanies of Satan on Y Records. Put away the crucifixes and holy water. Your stereo is not possessed by demons, although this is one record I wouldn't advise playing backwards. The lady has one hell of a voice and uses it to make shrieks, grunts, screams, and other vocal gyrations that couldn't possibly come from a human being. Even a battery of synthesizers would be hard-pressed to match the searing cacophony of wild women with steak knives, which features Ms. Galass on solo screen with the only effects being minimal reverb and stereo panning. This record has a place in any collection, but don't be too surprised if, while you're listening, a big red guy that's all on fire pokes his head up through the floorboards and asks you to turn it up. Can't stop it. Robin Gristle's greatest hits on Rough Trade Records. This collection is a must for TG fans that can't spend the cash for their new mandatory box set, which does at least contain the last live show recorded by Paul Cutler and myself in San Francisco, or pay the exorbitant collector's fees for the original singles, if you can even find them. Throbbing Gristle have become the new kings of repackaging, especially when you consider that none of them are dead, yet. Great picture of Cozy on the cover. Billy Idol on Chrysalis Records. The only worthwhile thing this faggot's done since the first generation X single was a killer version of L.A. Woman with Vox Pop who were even more fucked up than him at the Café de Grand. This wimpy slab of plastic is probably going to get the shit played out of it on the radio, which is okay because there's plenty of that on this LP. Hair as above on Shock Records. Iceland's still a haven for pagans, and even though I can't understand a word these guys say, I still get the definite feeling that this LP would scare the shit out of any Icelandic-speaking Christian. The cover alone, with a naked guy in a pentagram with a pyramid for a head, surrounded by druid runes on the front, and some guy jogging obliviously past their president's mansion in his birthday suit on the back, 
has no doubt made this record a popular heating fuel in many a conservative Icelandic home. Good production with clean guitars, big old drums, and really eerie vocals. All in all, a real neat package. SPK, Life in the Sky on Thermidor Records. Another fantastic collection of catchy tunes and danceable ditties from Australia's favorite song painters, SPK. Alumni of various mental institutions, though there has been some speculation as to whether they were actually employees or possibly inmates. These mellow blues cats have since taken to performing their audio experiments on an unsuspecting public. This first American release ranges in content from the haunting beauty of violence and perversion to the mellow sounds of death and destruction, with just a taste of insanity, pestilence, and plague. Lie back, listen, enjoy, have a seizure. Anti-Nowhere, Lee, Anti-Nowhere, Lee, on WXYZ Records. Third from the Sun on Siren Records. When I first listened to this record, I was amazed. It sounded like punk rock Martians on acid, certainly more high energy than their earlier efforts. Then, Jesus informed me that it would probably sound even better on the right speed. After making the necessary adjustments, I was even more impressed. These guys have a real innovative approach which is best described as noisy experimental rock. A must for headbangers, punks, or anyone who decides to spend their weekend beer money on LSD for a change. Or as G.I. Joe says, Pull out the sleeping bags. Video Lunch, 1313 on Ruby Records. The vocals are as tasty croutons topping the tossed green salad of backing tracks. But, waitress, where's the dressing? Hopefully, this album will spawn more suicides than Gloomy Sunday. Who want to survive? Who want to survive? Who want to survive?